All right. Good evening. My name is Brad Vogel, and I am the executive director of the New York Preservation Archive Project. And our whole mission is to make sure that the story of the historic preservation movement in New York City gets preserved and told. Um, and really, we do that as a way to inform future preservation efforts, um, but also really to inspire uh, future preservation efforts to show both the wins and the losses that make up this sort of grand tapestry, all the efforts of human beings to try to save things that they find to be of special quality in the city. So tonight we have our fifth and final installment of a series that we've been doing now for several months in 2021. That is the Inspired by Grassroots Stories Community Architectural Advocacy Series. And we have had some really great groups on here to talk about preservation at the intersection of neighborhood and community. And we've had lots of different slices of life from across the boroughs in New York City. And so that's why I'm really excited tonight that we will be looking at a different borough, a borough uh, that some might say is unexpected. Uh, we will be heading on the ferry over to Staten Island. So I'll let, uh, let our moderator, Kelly Carroll, uh, talk about that uh, to a much greater extent here <laughs> shortly. Um, but first, I did want to say, uh, we do have some sponsors uh, who made this whole series possible. One of those is the New York State Council for the Arts, so NISCA. Also, Pat Reisinger, who is uh, a gentleman who is out there trying to run pretty much every street in the city. Uh, so he has a great perspective on the city and uh, was, was there at the beginning as we started the sort of gestation for the idea for this series. So thank you to Pat. Um, and one other tidbit, um, you know, and actually one more thank you first. We should thank the Historic Districts Council, um, our friends there who have done so much uh, to network and grow out with all the different groups that have been on this program, uh, helping to sort of generate a lot of the material that we are now learning the history about tonight. Um, but now on to this special pitch to those of you who are here tonight. We have a very special evening plan for this coming Monday, November 22nd, at uh, actually from 5.30 to 7.30. We will have an oral history sharing event. And essentially it's taking people who've narrated for this series of programs and from another effort that we had underway this year, that an oral history intensive, all of those narrators are welcome to show up and go beyond the virtual experience in person at the Fulton Stall Market in Lower Manhattan and tell a little bit more, go beyond this, uh, this screen phase to tell you how preservation stories really unfolded in their neighborhoods. So we have a great, uh, great set of people who've committed to that and we'll have some treats. Please do feel free to stop by. But now, without further ado, our moderator for the evening, a historic preservation consultant here in the city, Kelly Carroll. Thank you, Brad. And thank you to our guests tonight joining us from Staten Island. And I also wanna just thank um, our sponsors and the whole NIPAP team uh, for putting together this amazing program. It was such a pleasure to work with everyone throughout this. Um, we just had one more person join. Um, so I am Kelly Carroll and I have the pleasure of speaking with three individuals tonight for our last oral history series. So I will go ahead and introduce them now. Uh, the first being Linda Cutler Hauk. She is a lifelong resident of Tottenville, Staten Island. Also the founder in 2005 and current director of the Tottenville Historical Society that is fo focused geographically on the Southern communities of Staten Island. In 2005, she had the privilege of working side by side with Barnett Shepherd founder of the Preservation League of Staten Island on a project that began with a historic building survey. Around the same time, the controversy surrounding the now designated James L. and Lucinda Bedell House quickly and fully propelled them into historic preservation efforts. <clears throat> Incidentally, that survey evolved into the highly acclaimed book, which many of you may have heard of by Barnett Shepherd, Tottenville, the town the oyster built, its people, industry, and architecture. We also have John Kilcullen, who has been a resident of Staten Island for the last 29 years, 
a Long Island native, he traded the big island for a smaller one. He and his husband, Jim, live in a restored New York City landmark as a shingle style Victorian in Tompkinsville's, Tompkinsville's Fort Hill neighborhood. By day, he works in Tottenville with New York City Parks as the director of Conference House Park, a 270 acre park with five historic houses, three miles of shoreline and an emerging new forest. An active member of the community, John is currently on the board of directors president of the Preservation League of Staten Island, a volunteer organization advocating protecting the island's architectural and historic environment. He is also a member of the island's Greenbelt Conservancy and Friends of Tompkinsville Park. John enjoys open water swimming in Lower New York Bay and trail running on the many trails of the Greenbelt and of course, Conference House Park. Last but not least, we have Franco Paulino, who is a resident of Staten Island and a board member and social media person for the Preservation League of Staten Island. And he also um, is the creator and manager of Wild Staten Island, which is um, a wonderful view into the borough um, that many may not uh, otherwise see. So with that, thank you all again. And my warm up question, and uh, Linda's touched on this briefly in her bio, but every, um, every preservationist has a, an induction story, this weird fascination we have with the built environment. Um, I would like each of you to briefly describe if you had a flashpoint moment or an event that happened that opened you, that, that turned you uh, into the preservationists that you are. Absolutely. And uh, that began in 2005. Um, we had just begun to organize as a uh, historical society here in Tottenville. And uh, by the way, uh, Tottenville is the only community, uh, separate community on Staten Island that has its own a specific historical society. There is of course a Staten Island Historical Society, but um, I saw and felt the need uh, to preserve our history here and um, therefore uh, uh, founded the uh, Historical Society with uh, great support from uh, businesses and politicians and residents and um, uh, it just took off in 2005. Um, no sooner had we begun to organize. If you recall in 2005, there was um, a, a building boom and um, not so much new development as it was take one down, put three up. And uh, Tottenville was hit hard by this. Nearly every street was uh, uh, losing its uh, historic buildings and um, as many as they could fit on the parcel, which tended to be larger parcels, uh, were going up quickly. Um, this is the house that um, inspired us to uh, begin our efforts with historic preservation. And this is the James L. and Lucinda Bedell house on Amboy Road in Tottenville. Uh, this is before and this is ultimately what happened uh, when the uh, uh, builder, uh, new owner slash builder, uh, after he bought the house and um, found out he could not demolish it um, as he wished to and put five townhouses on that lot. And I have to say, uh, at that time, there was great community support for the effort to stop this, and not only for this particular house, but what was going on, not only on the South Shore, but also on Staten Island. And um, members of the community did uh, gather and uh, we protested, we had walks, we wrote letters, and ultimately it was our mayor at the time, Mayor Bloomberg, who stepped in and uh, stated at a uh, community meeting that the house would be designated. And of course there was a lot of controversy about that too, but um, you know, it, 
it um, we made a lot of noise and um, and actually it really wasn't until about 2007, 2008 when the recession hit that things started to uh, slow down a bit. But um, that was a turning point for us. And we knew, uh, we knew where we could find our history, which really had not been uncovered or discovered at yet, as yet. Um, and yet we were, we were losing the buildings that represent and tell us a story um, of our uh, community's history. So this was really a major a turning point for us. And then of course, uh, our involvement with the Preservation League of Staten Island uh, started then uh, with Barnett. And uh, from there, I, you know, I got to know and work with John and um, we uh, continue to uh, collaborate together. Thank you. Yeah, and the Bedell House is such um, the poster child of a preservation success story. It's today through all of what it's been through. It's, it's such a, a beautiful piece of architecture and an asset to Tottenville. Yeah. Unfortunately, for uh, everyone we've lost uh, or everyone we've gained, we've lost uh, four, at least four, and that continues today. Um, we've had some really wonderful examples of um, not only historical, but architecturally significant houses. And um, we've not been able to um, attain a landmark designation for them. Um, so learning about the landmarks process too was uh, something um, that has, um, uh, taken time to, to get used to um, and uh, it can be um, discouraging and disheartening at times. And uh, we see that more so now um, than before, than in 2005 even. And it continues, unfortunately, as John well knows. Yes, and we will we'll touch on, on that um, culture of preservation for sure in Staten Island that might be different and in some other areas of the city. Um, John and Franco, do you wanna share your flashpoint moment? And uh, Okay, um, my, and I, and I thank, hello everyone. Uh, oh, just on cue, the dog starts to bark. Um, it, Walker. Um, my flashpoint was, and I, I put the uh, going from Long Island to Staten Island, and I remember the first time I rode my bike to the ferry, took the ferry over, and rode to Stock Harbor, um, and I was struck. I'd never been to Staten Island, particularly the North, and was struck by the number of old homes. And then from there, I, I mean, the bug bit. It was Fillmore Street that goes right into Snug Harbor. And I said, look at these homes. And it was amazing. So uh, that was my flashpoint. And then started to see how things very rapidly were, you know, Linda mentioned her, this was probably like 1998, 99. And I was struck at, wow, this beautiful house. And the next thing I know, it's on a large lot in West Brighton, Livingston, and it's being torn down and three houses are going up. Quickly met Barnett. Jim Ferrari and many of the folks, the Preservation League. And, you know, it's uh, something that I've stuck with. Uh, Linda is my sounding board on the frustrations I have with uh, just preservation on Staten Island. It is so difficult. And Kelly and I've talked about this in, in the greater city and Jean as well. It is just difficult, but I think we have to stick with it. So that was the flashpoint or driving my bike, riding my bicycle and saying, oh my gosh, this is a wonderful, nugget and we need to preserve it. Thank you. Well, I think mine was um, part of Staten Island, what makes Staten Island, Staten Island is the unique houses we have, the, these older homes, this beautiful architecture, the history behind them. And then like Linda was saying, there was this building boom where they were taking down these old historic houses and then we were putting up four or five cookie cutter houses that all look the same, that didn't have anything unique about them. There's no history about them. And that wasn't even so much the flashpoint for me. It was more so that there was no public out. People didn't seem to care. I mean, they, obviously there are groups um, that, that, and people that did care, but over, overwhelmingly there were people that did not care. Just 
whatever, tear down the house, let's put up six that look the same. Um, and most of that was because people didn't understand the history behind a lot of these houses. And when I would tell them, well, this is the history of that house that just went down, they'd be like, oh, mm. really, I didn't know that. And even houses that are still standing, uh, when you tell people the history about them, they, there's an appreciation. So that was kind of like the catalyst for me to kind of get out the history of these houses um, and of the island so that people can actually appreciate it. Because if you don't know the history about it, you don't know something's there, then you're not going to appreciate it. You're not going to protect it. So that was kind of uh, it for me. Yeah, I, 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 I can appreciate that. Um, Staten Island is, is so different than the other boroughs in terms of its, um, its built environment that it's harder sometimes for people to see the individual resource because there isn't this monolithic street of row houses for, you know, for instance, like how some of the other boroughs look um, and people can have a hard time seeing one property for what it is or even appreciating the history like you've described. Um, so in that vein, um, Staten Island actually has the least amount of landmarks per borough um, out of the other five, which is, um, you know, a bit sad because it also has the oldest architecture out of all of the boroughs. And I, I wanna be careful and not to um, not give credit to the Landmarks Commission. This past summer, we did have a recent designation of Conference House Park, which reflected the significance of Native Americans who had uh, inhabited that site intergenerationally, I think for six generations. Mm -hmm. Um, and then there was also a, a designation in 2019 of Audrey Lord's house. Um, in both of these cases, these, these designations were, um, were put in place on resources that already had a layer of protection, Conference House Park being a New York City park, mm -hmm. um, the Audrey Lord House being a part of the St. Paul's Avenue, Stapleton Heights Historic District, which was designated in 2004. While it is important to expand um, periods of significance or events of significance and, into, and bake these into designations, um, Staten Island did not gain any new resources from a regulatory standpoint. And I call this a double dipping designations, okay? Mm -hmm. So prior to that, um, we'll get into landmark designations that happened a few years even before that, but I wanna hear um, some thoughts from you guys about how you feel about these double dipped designations um, that were your most recent. Can I, I'll go first, I guess. I, just because that, thank you, Kelly, for that. Um, that is something that my, my colleagues on Staten Island, it was something I addressed uh, early on with the LPC, plus the lack of designations. We actually went with New York One and highlighted this. It got a little movement because we've had many things pending for uh, requests for evaluation and um, the LPC just is too slow to react. And I, I, I the one, I, I, the, the conference house one was touchy uh, because it's private and professional, but uh, the Orgy Lord House was in the district. I reminded them that of the 10 they designated, seven were already designated. This is citywide. And we, when we submit new landmarks, I, I, for, for, for evaluation, we really think about them, the ones that Linda and I have talked about on the South Shore and the, on the balance of the island. These are ones that the island doesn't have in the, the resource or catalog of protected sites. Theaters, uh, hospital buildings, uh, interiors, um, and buildings that have, and, and, and the LPC is looking at that, ones with uh, the abolitionist movement so that is a frustration and the double dipping. We, we haven't, when we had a recent meeting with Landmarks, we brought these up and they said, oh, well, uh, the Native American history. And I politely said, that's great, but it was double protected. Um, the city through the parks department goes, you know, very due diligence on not disturbing the site. So it was, wasn't threatened with the parking lot, a basketball court, new houses. Uh, and that's really, 
our, our problem that we've been trying to, to, to address. Um, so it's, it's, um, it's something we're, we're, we're continuing to work on. So uh, that's, you know, I'll answer that for now. Linda or Franco, do you want to add anything to that? Um, I don't uh, need to add anything to that. I think John said it well about, uh, especially about Conference House Park. Um, we have to sit back and say to ourselves, what are we doing here? Um, uh, first of all, on Staten Island, there are uh, so few um, organizations or individuals who uh, speak up for uh, designation of properties. And um, we had hoped that those few of us, uh, especially the Preservation League of Staten Island, when they brought a property to the attention of landmarks, that um, it, it might have, um, some merit, um, you know, just based on the, uh, you know, the reputation of the organization. And that's proved not to be so. And um, I, for instance, the Tottenville Historical Society two years ago brought two properties, um, important properties to the attention of uh, landmarks. Uh, one be having uh, strong connections to um, an early 1800s African American family that uh, uh, moved here, relocated from Virginia. And um, we did the research on the property um, as, as much as we could. Um, and um, a conversation with them just a few weeks ago, there's absolutely nothing has been done. Nothing more has been learned. Nothing more has been looked at. And um, so we sit back and scratch our heads and say, what are we doing here? Um, we're the advocates for these properties. This is part of, of what we um, have been called to do, to recognize and ask for uh, consideration and nothing happens. Yet, they look at properties that are already protected and uh, spend their time doing doing um, pointless um, <laughs> um, <And>, whatever. <laughs> and just to add, I know I'm, I'm I'm watching a time. You know, they also when we when we present properties, we get and all of the, I think everyone on this call can appreciate this. Oh, it's been altered or this or that and. I will bring up time and time again, a counterpointed building, a counter building in the other outer boroughs. Oh, but constantly, I said, but they're not being consistent. If you're gonna do one thing, stay consistent. In the case of theaters, we have no landmark exterior theater. Oh, this building's altered. I said, the one in Ridgewood, Queens, in Coney Island, in Upper Manhattan, all had the same gobbledygook, my professional word, um, <laughs> altered beyond repair and and they say oh it's an alter but the building i presented the tompkinsville theater or folks want to look 120 um victory boulevard has the terracotta it's in perfect condition it says tompkinsville theater it, it's ready made and it's being adaptive or reused i mean i can't um stress how much we 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 present things that are ready made and 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 we just get turned away and they look at things and the broad, broader priorities. It is very frustrating. Um, and I know Kelly, you're gonna talk about some of these. So I just bring that up again. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm glad you brought up the theater. I think that um, there are certain marks of civilization, um, right? Like I think of, even in the smallest towns um, that were developed in the 20th century or late, late 19th, you always have a church, a school, um, a synagogue or yes. uh, a theater, um, a library. We have these like civic spaces, right? That even the smallest of towns have. And so when you have an entire county or borough in New York City that cannot uh, claim uh, one theater, um, when there are many that I would, I would argue are viable for landmark, exactly. um, 
it is it is a bit odd. And um, I have also just to touch on your your comment specifically about the Tompkinsville Theater. You're absolutely right. The terracotta um, is in great condition. Um, you know, it is it's getting close to 100 years old, but it's crisp. It's legible. Um, the building itself, I think, has sufficient integrity that convey that conveys its original use as a theater, and it it does have some infill replacement that reflects its changing use. But that infill is typical of any type of uh, storefront infill that we we see all over. The exactly, and, and 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 its counterparts in the other boroughs that were recently designated had the exact same infill. Um, and you know, it's fun. I'm glad you said that. But we, Linda and I, speak about this, and and Franco. Um, it, when Tompkinsville or any town on Staten Island was ascending, they went from wood buildings to masonry terracotta. They had money to spend. They, in the twenties and thirties and forties, they were going to their theaters. I, and I stress this to the, to the, to the landmarks commission. And in case the Tompkinsville theater, you can see when the building was built surrounding it, on all vintage photos are wood frame buildings uh, that are no longer there. And here's a building that they wanted. So every town had one. I know down by Jean in, in, New, in, in New Dorp, in that part of the uh, Toad Hill, New Dorp area, there was theater there. So every town had a theater that you could walk to. Yeah. So it, 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 uh, it belies logic why they're, they're saying, oh, and they look at, and again, Staten Island stayed rural up until 1960 really yeah. in the sense if, when the bridge opened. So the North Shore was developed. It was, the, there was a ferry service. It, it, there were no interstate bridges until the thirties. Then a interborough bridge was not until 1960. So they, they, they have this, again, New York city mentality, one size fits all. And, you know, uh, it, it's, and they, and I'm looking at the building behind you, Kelly is, it's ready made, but there are a lot of buildings that are slightly altered, but still have as much beauty and historic fabric and architectural charm uh, and significance that that one does, but that has clabbered on it. You know, it can still have some vinyl, but still have the supporting elements and keeping it um, intact. Right. And I, I'm a firm believer in that if something is designated, it, it can encourage the kind of sensitive restorations to bring buildings into the kind of shape that this house is behind me. Right. Um, and all of those things are done with mm -hmm. great care. And we do have uh, many wood frames covered in siding that are in the Green Greenpoint Historic District, as an example. Um, so to go back to these designations, I'm actually going to share my screen for a minute because I'm going to put a really old house up that you all will know but um, our guests may not. And here is our bios. So I'm going to put up this house. Please be patient as I navigate. Okay. So this was, um, this was during the last batch of uh, significant designations that occurred on Staten Island, um, starting in 2015, wrapping up in 2017. And I, bring this house up. This is the um, Lakeman Cortelyu Taylor house. Um, it, this house has um, a ton of evidence that points to its state of construction to be around 1683. Uh, we don't have a lot of structures from the 1600s left in New York City. Um, you know, I'm still always shocked when I see a 200 year old federal house peeking out at me um, from beneath signage on Grand Street in Manhattan, let, and let alone something that's, you know, even older by, you know, a century. Um, so this house, um, I think anywhere else would have been, you know, an axiomatically designated just for its age um, and its persistence. Um, in you know what has obviously we can see from the map here there's been a lot of subdivision which is a, a big problem as we've heard um, for preservation or for these houses so this um this was designated by the commission uh in 2016 they knew that there was going to be pushback but they were they felt that this house was so old and it had survived to to this point um it also was calendared originally in 1966 so the 
original Landmarks Commission had this property on their priority list when the Landmarks Commission was a very young commission. Um, despite that, because of owner opposition um, and council opposition um, from council member Matteo, who uh, said that, quote, landmarking was an added burden, um, and the owner said that uh, landmarking would prevent the viable operation of his business. This was actually rescinded and the property was turned back. So my question for the group is, how do we as preservationists change, and this is like a pie in the sky question, how do we shift this culture um, on Staten Island, both from a constituent and elected official standpoint to to convince people that getting landmarked is not a death knell for your property, for your investment, for, for your, your happiness. <laughs> how, do we, how do we change that so, so tragedies like the Lakeman Portelli Taylor House do not keep happening? Well, I would say that one of the main things is kind of education about the properties. Um, the, if people don't understand what the house is, the history of the house, any special architectural features, it, there's not going to be an appreciation for it. Um, I mean, they still may not want landmarking, but I think it, it, if we do better in educating people about the history, the stories of these houses, what makes them unique, there, there's more, more a better likelihood of them wanting to Active. Education is key. Yep. We've struggled with this um, uh, and addressed it, um, talked about it, um, and just uh, cannot seem to come up with uh, an answer to that question. Uh, yes, education is absolutely part of it, and the benefits of uh, uh, landmarking we know outweigh what will happen or can happen, um, but um, uh, the general public uh, has this mindset that uh, you just cannot tell me what to do with my property, period. And uh, they can't get over that enough to uh, recognize the, uh, the value of uh, their building to the, uh, you know, the, the landscape of Staten Island. I, I don't, I, that's, a, that's a tough question and I wish I had the answer and um, I don't, I just don't know how to address it. Um, you know, we've done uh, uh, community uh, discussions um, and of course uh, some folks get defensive and some folks wanna learn and, um, it, uh, it can be a challenge. So I don't know what the answer is. John? Um, and, and, and Linda, I think our, our recent conversation with Landmarks, I think as an agency, a regu they're a re they, they like to say they're a regulatory agency, but they have lots of depth in their staff, as we all know. Um, I think they, they I think with the public hearing landmarks and then buildings that in the case of Staten Island, I, I know we're gonna run out of time. We can talk about no, it's this. It's okay, we have some time. Keep oh, um, just and what the buildings that are failing that we've been advocating for the city owned buildings for that for the landmarks to really try to move things along. I think they there's this rigidness to LPC, even in their talking um, when we talk to people, when I talk to people, I say landmarks doesn't mean the building has to stay etched in time. Folks, I've had this time and time again. You can't touch a window. You can't change a doorknob. You can't change your light. You can change the light. You can change things. Not You don't want to put pink siding on a building, but you can change the building. Uh, not, not You can make changes. Talk to them. I mean, look at the Gavin's Ford Market. I mean, the landmark does not keep consistent. And, and I see you should, they they will allow one thing in the moneyed areas of the city, but yet in other areas they are sticklers for the littlest thing. And I think it's the message gets diluted. And they're not out here. And we 
we've asked in the case of Siemens Retreat on Bay Street and Vic, uh, Vanderbilt, we've said, how can we help you get adaptive reuse? Oh, we don't regulate use. Um, th th thank you. Um, this building, and I have a photo up on this upper uh, portico, there's graffiti because there's people getting in. We've said, we'll help you. We'll work with the council people. Linda's resource, you know, people would love this. This building overlooks New York Harbor and they say, we don't regulate. We've been talking to the owners. We told them he's got a violation. He needs to maintain it. And then that's where it goes. And there's no real active activism for this building. Case in point, uh, and, and, and I know Gene was involved with the um, uh, flag estate. Uh, they, they didn't allow the development, the, the subdevelopment, which was great, but adaptive reuse that could benefit the community that works um, and be a little bit more flexible. I, and nothing was up happening with uh, the uh, flag estate. But I, I fear like their conversation is, nope, can't do this. We have to follow the law without saying, what can we do? We'll work with you. I, I haven't seen that on Staten Island. And we're, you know, so many buildings are in litigation because they, you know, I know that uh, you just had up um, uh, the Lighthouse Depot building. If you go back to that one, Kelly, uh, this is one that is now has a tarp. This uh, upper part had been tarped by the developer and it ripped, moisture's getting in. And now the developer who did it, the, the, the uh, preservation architectural firm can no longer, they, they lost the contract or their contract expired. So it's been sitting and they've issued a violation, but here it just sits. And then the adjacent buildings, which are on the national register. And this goes back, I, I, I wanna say where they're not looking at adding more the other buildings are on the national register, but LPC won't step in to even say, hey, you need to do something on this. Just as a courtesy to say, we can't regulate it, but that uh, outer wall could fall down and hurt some because no one's looking at it. The national register has really no active, as you know, active uh, oversight. So, um, I, I went on a little long, but uh, there, there are so many frustrating um, issues. The Manesa Gain down in, in the Tottenville area at Princess Bay, same thing. We won the loss, they won the lawsuit, forced him to stabilize the building. Now it's sitting and he's playing a, a game of, um, you know, uh, uh, push comes to shove. I'm not gonna do anything. You know, had the big hole in the roof. Now it's sitting, his plans are approved. He wants to sell it and he's just gonna, wait it out. And we have a landmark that has a big tarp, overgrown vegetation. And it's probably one of the sec, one of the top oldest buildings on Staten Island, if not the city. Yeah, so I'm glad you, you we, we got to this because this is definitely, um, I, one thing I wanted to talk about tonight is, so you have this, there's a culture problem um, with people being fearful and usually we're, there's fear, there is also aggression. Um, aggression usually is, is rooted in fear and fear is usually because people are uncertain, right? And so all of this kind of feeds it each other, but at the same, concurrently, you do have properties that are landmarked, right? And so for instance, the building on my screen, the old Siemens retreat, um, you know, this was Staten Island's first hospital. I mean, what a superlative to have. Of course, it should be a landmark. It is a landmark, the physician's residence, which is not pictured, but it's also a landmark as part of this um, property. Um, so you have these properties that are protected, but they're allowed to deteriorate like this, which is almost um, like an undermining of, if we do put this, layer of protection on, is it actually enforced? Does it actually mean something? Um, and, you know, there are example after example in the borough of, of landmarks that are unfortunately a little forlorn. And um, I was wondering, um, like, what, what is the most recent update with this building? I know that you had caught people um, removing copper from the soffit on the middle pediment. Um, you know, in this era in New York where we're, 
be becoming reacquainted with our waterfronts. We're reclaiming our waterfronts. Um, this Staten Island has such a has such roots in its seafaring past that you know this building faces the water. What needs to be done to bring this landmark into our future? Um, you know, what would what would is it an ownership issue? What can we give people as an update tonight on this? Oh, thank you, Kelly. It, it, it I'm sorry, Linda. Were you going to say something? Oh, no, go ahead, John. Go ahead. We the update they issued a violation. We had a meeting two weeks ago. <clears throat> They've issued a violation. I guess it's a non-monetary to say you need to secure the building. We brought up when we had a meeting with the council person, how can we as the Preservation League, the Tottenville Historical Society, other groups work with the landmarks? Any other town would have a simple landmark committee to say, how can we get someone in there that is looking for this? It, it has, I, don't, I think the square footage, I'm not sure on it, but it's a very large building. Um, they've talked about a school, uh, but in this case, it's on a large, adjacent just off screen to the right is a large open area that is non-landmarked adjacent to this uh, physician's house. I think there's a lot of redevelopment uh, scenarios at play. They're hoping no one will notice the building could fall. They claim hardship. Um, the whole site is by transportation, the Clifton train station. And they're gonna say, um, <clears throat> you know, oh, we can't do anything landmarks, can we take it off the designation? Um, this is where I actually stood in front of this building when we met with New York One to bring up the case of, um, we had no landmarks since 2016 and we still don't. And, and they give us, so oh, the priorities and I, and I, I, get, I get extremely frustrated with this and um, it's, it's we, 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 we go through this all the time. I'm sorry, was I muted during that? Just the so, last, just the last second. Okay, sorry. Uh, I didn't no, okay. So no, we, we just, uh, there's no, they don't seem to want to work with the community and we are, Linda's, and I know Linda's gonna express this, we are like at our wits end sometimes that we have no, where they're not really trying to stick the course in other boroughs, they just prevail and say, we want this landmark. I've seen it, I've given them the, where they override or really stick with what the designation was um, and, and support it. So we are, we are very frustrated uh, when, when it comes to general preservation, because how can I, as a president of the Preservation League say, hey, support this when this building, buildings in Tottenville, buildings uh, in and around Mid Island are, are looking horrible when, and they say, oh, look what happens. They don't do anything. That, you landmark your building, you don't have to do anything and you let it fall down. Right. Yeah, I think we have a lot of cases of this uh, where they're trying to do demolition through neglect where, like John said, we're just gonna leave it and then it's just gonna go down because we didn't do anything and we'll get around landmark that. Um, also with landmarking there, there have been houses that have had the owner support for landmarking, and yet they won't landmark. Mm -hmm. uh, 49 Bard Avenue, which was a 1850s gatehouse. Yes. The Preservation League supported landmarking. The owner yep. asked for it to be landmarked. Yes, thank you, right. They, they did not want anything to happen to the house after they sold it. So you had an owner begging for their house to be landmarked, an 1850s gatehouse. But it wasn't because they said the gatehouse had been altered. And it, I wish I had a picture of the house. It's a beautiful house architecturally. And yeah. so we have, we have houses that have full support from the community, full support from the owner, but they're told no. Thank you, Franco. I, we, had, we had one across the street and the owner was a, Edward Sargent submitted. They said, oh, it makes a better uh, district designation. The owners were 100% in favor of it. Um, this is another one we have pending. 
they like it because it has the abolitionist background with an Elliot McKenzie and one on Delafield, not too far from there. But again, um, it's brick, it's not altered, it has the history, but yet, um, as Franco just said, I, uh, I knew the owner, she lived in the St. George district, bought that carriage house, restored it, wanted to protect it, and they said no. I mean, we had the, the preservation, like Barnett Shepherd, uh, who many of you know, you know, wrote a letter and they said no. And, and you go, how, how is that possible when the owner wants to landmark their building? They're saying, I want to take the burden of landmarking on, knowing it may alter my uh, resale value, but I believe in this. Happily, the building, the, the new owners who I had a chance to speak to shortly after, they per they've not done anything to it, but there's always the threat of it, of it going some, sometime down the, the line. Yeah, it's, um, it's interesting what you just said about how in Staten Island, and I've, I've spoken to Jean um, Prabhu about this too, that owners, there's a, it's just affecting resale value means a bad thing, which is so interesting because especially, let's just, no, in basically every other borough, because the Bronx is gaining landmarks um, a lot more these days, your landmark status actually increases your resale value. Um, and that was a selling point, um, even in, no pun intended, in, down here in Bay Ridge, where there were initially some opposition, uh, same mentality about don't tell me what to do. Um, I think the difference here is that neighbors can see how collectively something looks better with its cohesion um, and it's in everyone's best interest for resale if you keep something looking a particular type of way. And I think that type of perspicacity is lost on Staten Island because you are dealing with individual parcels which in our current real, real estate market have a tremendous um, value to be divided up um, and when you divide up, um, you not only lose the historic resource, but you lose um, the, a character defining feeling of that borough as a place that's more bucolic. Um, and it's, um, it's a problem. Um, so just, go ahead. I, I just want to add to what Franco had said. In addition, right behind the Siemens retreat is the original Bailey Seaton 1930s building that was the first US uh, health and hospital building. We met with the council person. She supported it being looked at further. We brought it up again in our meeting and there has an, oh, there's still medical issues. And she said, it's not a hospital, it's half empty. And when and I brought this up and they had no answer uh, and Linda jumped in, they looked at me like, oh no, we're still looking at it. And she turned to them in the previous meeting and said, how do I get this fast tracked? Because it does not, the, build, the, the, the newer building behind the Siemens retreat is probably twice the size, has so much adaptive reuse. But again, there's this speculation that it sits on the land that's so valuable, they tore three of the other doctor's hospital buildings down along Vanderbilt Avenue. And um, we, 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 we write letters and we, 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 we stand in front of the, and the, the building and, and say this is a the Staten Island's first hospital a U.S. hospital it was sold to the city for a dollar and um, when they had the current council woman saying I'd like this landmark I was born not that she was saying oh, I was born there it's a great building they've done nothing on it so it's frustrating I, I go back to that that F word just a uh if I may, a quick mention about the, the mindset of Staten Islanders. And uh, again, we'll go back to the uh, opening of the bridge in the 1960s. Um, property values uh, were pretty good out here. Um, you could get uh, land real cheap and um, 
if you're lucky, you had a, a house on it and it was a larger parcel or even vacant land, you could get pretty cheap too. And I, and development really didn't start um, until after the 60s. And by the 1980s, um, that's when really uh, uh, large scale development started. It did take about 20 years. So those coming here in the 80s um, uh, knew that they were coming to uh, probably have their kids go through uh, grammar school or the school system. And then they had one foot out the door already. So they were thinking already when they got here, I'm gonna live here for X number of years and then I'm gonna sell my house and I'm gonna to move to New Jersey or Pennsylvania. And that trend has continued since the 1980s. And I think that's had a great impact on people uh, who come here and never really embrace the community or a preservation of their community because they know they weren't gonna be here long-term. And um, that's, uh, I think, part of the, um, part of the, again, mindset of Staten Islanders. In general, they don't, uh, they don't embrace the history of their communities here. Um, Years ago, we had we had local history programs in the public school system and even in in the uh, uh, Catholic schools, and uh, that's gone by the wayside too. So it's multifaceted what's happened here and why people do not embrace uh, preservation. And unfortunately, um, uh, uh, the the almighty dollar is part of that, and um, I don't. I don't really see that changing. I remember back um, in around 2005, I know there was talk about, um, uh, I think HDC uh, was looking into uh, some kind of tax credits for uh, uh, landmark property owners. We had hoped there would be some kind of um, marketing of landmarks, uh, an education program, some kind of funding available. Um, for landmark property owners too. And I think if there was a package, um, it would have helped a great deal, but nothing ever came to fruition, uh, fruition on e any of those points. So um, we're still swimming and sinking um, and drowning really. Um, and I don't know what the answer is. Yeah, you're absolutely right that um, incentivizing this would help a lot. And the, the irony is that when you have an, an honorific designation of National Register, you can get tax credits. But when you have this regulatory binding designation of a, the local law, you, you don't. Um, and there is, there is a pathway to kind of layer those and get those tax credits, but it's, it's still work. Um, it's not, it's not just an automatic, it comes with a package. Um, and I totally agree with you. You know, um, there's also an art deco, you know, WPA era hospital in Jersey city. That's enormous. That sat crumbling for years and it is recently reopened as the beacon, uh, residential complex. And when it was opened, it was the largest historic preservation tax credit completed in the United States. Mm. And if that had if it weren't for those tax credits, those buildings would still either be rotting um, or worse, they would be gone. So, um, you know, there are there are tools, but they're not always working together. Um, we are almost at time. So I'm gonna ask my last question is, is a fun game I like to play from time to time, which is if you had a magic landmark wand, what would you designate Emergency designate tonight. Hmm. I don't know about uh, an emergency designation, but I would have a wish. Okay. And my, my wish, if I had a magic wand, I would wish that uh, the Landmarks Preservation Commission would decentralize. And I would wish that um, 
Staten Island and the other boroughs could make decisions for uh, their own uh, uh, borough um, as opposed to having to go to the Landmarks Preservation Commission who really uh, doesn't um, have a full understanding of what's important to us. Every borough is different. And I think we look at each, uh, and we look at properties differently. And I think uh, they have to respect that and they don't. A great wish. John? Uh, I would right now I and I sent it to them is the Paramount Theater. Uh, it's slated for demolition. Um, oh, I didn't know that. Out of the blue, it came up, and we've had it submitted. They've looked at it, but again, you send them something to say it, it's threatened. They file plans to build a because it's now part of the Bay Street Corridor. Yep. Barnett Shepherd included it as the history of the Bay Street Corridor. And which is an, was an upzoning, and now they're they're going ahead with it because it wasn't protected because landmark said it lost a lot of it, but it had fabric in terms of it being the largest theater on Staten Island, uh, some terracotta elements. It was you know, and before it lost many of the elements, it, it could have been landmark. So that would be an emergency mm -hmm. landmark a designation, and and also wishing for monies to fix it up, but that would be mine at the moment. And it had a, a fantastic Art Deco interior as well. Oh yeah, and, and it still has, the, the interior is still there. It, it's, they were using it for film shoots and other things. So, uh, you know, and, and the irony is the same with Bailey Seaton. They love the decrepit, Gotham was filming, filming there like every year uh, because it's this decrepit, it looks like what Gotham the TV series uh, should look like decrepit New York, but. <laughs> right, the Arkham Asylum, yeah. 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 Franco? Well, I, you know what, it's hard to pick. There's so many on the island that need to be landmarked. Um, and 249 Bard is one of my favorites with the uh, field stone. Um, there's a house on Clove Road that was in the Vanderbilt family. I, I forget the exact uh, part of the family, but that's not landmark. Um, uh, like to see that. I, I could go down the list um, and we'd be here all night since we <laughs> seem to get anything landmark around here. And, and that one that's on has a it's a cottage uh, Victorian cottage with diamond shaped windows just charming and it has been submitted in the more recent recent ish past and again they they again they, they just don't seem the need and at the time it was the ownership was uh, in, in, in question so it would have been easier to move things in you know let's they should they need to uh, uh, strike while the iron is hot uh, for buildings like that if the ownership and then not that they're playing one over on an owner but if it's in flux you could make the case to landmark it and then worry about the the details on the other end I always uh, would joke that I would landmark every catholic church <laughs> just uh, instead of fight with the diocese um, so I want to thank I want to thank you guys so much for your participation tonight. We could be here all night. You're absolutely right, Franco, um, but we do have to to wrap it up. Um, I'm gonna hang back for a few minutes for questions. Um, if you need to run, please run. If you feel like being gracious, you can also hang out for a few minutes. But I really want to uh, thank you and NIPAP, the NIPAP team and all of our guests tonight for joining us for our very last series. And I hope to see some folks next, next week and cheers to uh, being in person and celebrating this wonderful program together. Absolutely. And special thanks to you, Kelly, for moderating the series. It's been a fantastic look at preservation history in the relatively recent past, which I think is really helpful um, to get that captured. And a special thanks to our guests this evening for really sharing sort of the nitty gritty of preservation on Staten Island and letting people know 
uh, how they can help and how they can perhaps change the course of preservation history in Staten Island. Mm -hmm. So thank you all once again. Thank you. Thank you.